question Who is the real treasure and worth? Answer, the Lord who fills heaven and earth God in his essence is infinite, transcendent, unlimited, exhibited in omnipresence Here's a stack of books And here's another stack And I stand between them, which is where I am going to wind up when the day is over. This stack of books right here is written by godly men who believe that signs and wonders, which were prayed for in this text, ceased when the apostles died as a normative ministry strategy. They don't deny that miracles happen today. They simply deny that as a normal pattern of ministry, we should seek and experience the kinds of signs and wonders that Jesus and the apostles experienced because the signs and wonders granted them were merciful provisions for the accreditation and the vindication of the once-for-all unique apostolic authority which we now have enshrined in the New Testament teaching, which they wrote. So we should not pursue or seek signs and wonders as they experience them. The stack of books over here argues that signs and wonders are for today, Miracles are for today and that they should be sought and that the reason we don't experience more of them is because we don't expect to experience more of them. And by and large, Jesus does not perform the things people are antagonistic to and do not expect. But rather, they should be sought for the blessing of the church and for the empowering of evangelism and missions. And I read these books and I comb the scriptures as I've done in the recent weeks and I pray and I agonize and again and again I find myself just tottering back and forth here in the middle uncertain about which one if either of these views is correct I don't necessarily find both of their arguments so weak I find both of their arguments very strong And so I finally decided that I can't just keep putting off a position on this forever and ever. The people really want to know what I think about these things. And we've been circling around on the outside and trying to build a foundation now for the past six weeks. And so it's time for me to at least say what I can say. And so I I forced myself to do it, and and so I'm going to do it. And uh, what I've decided to do is give you the four or five strongest reasons I've found for why this stack is true, and the four or five strongest reasons I've found for why this stack is true, and then see where we wind up as we put those arguments beside each other this morning. All right, let's begin with this stack over here. It's the historic one. And I don't want to give it a name. I think names wind up prejudicing us because they often sound chintzy or cheap or like some kind of ism. You know, you call this spiritualism, call this cessationism or something, and and you just wind up unhelpful. So let's just say these are the people, the God-loving evangelical people, who believe that there was a uniqueness about the experience of signs and wonders in the life of the apostles and Jesus, which is not to be repeated, but was used to vindicate and accredit their once-for-all authority, which is now in the New Testament on which we stand. Here are their reasons. Number one, in the book of Acts, what you find is that Luke, the writer, really does seem to try to make the point that signs and wonders were uniquely the province of the apostles. That is, it was uniquely their business to do signs and wonders, not just everybody's in the early church. Now, let me try to show you this. In chapter 2, verse 43, and we can just flip through. We'll look at four texts in the book of Acts, and you can look at them with me if you want. In chapter 2, verse 43, fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. 
doesn't say through the Christians in general, but it was through the apostles that signs and wonders were done in the crowd. Chapter 5, verse 12. Here it says, Now many signs and wonders were done among the people by the hands of the apostles. Not by the hands of everybody. It's not as though everybody was out doing a sign and a wonder that came through the hands of the apostles. Chapter 14, verse 3. Here we have Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. That's the they referred to here. And it says, verse 3 of chapter 14, So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And then finally, chapter 15, verse 12, you have Paul and Barnabas back home reporting about their missionary journey. And they say, chapter 15, verse 12, And all the assembly kept silence and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And you get the impression this is something remarkable. This isn't just happening every day among anybody in Jerusalem as they report. This is something astonishing that God used to vindicate his missionaries. The first point is that in the book of Acts, it appears that Luke's intention in writing is not to say that miracles were being done willy-nilly by Christians, but they were being done specifically through the hands of God's appointed spokesmen, the authoritative eyewitnesses called apostles. Piece of evidence number two. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And you can look at that with me if you want. 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the Apostle Paul is writing here in this text to defend his apostleship and argue that he's a real apostle, a real eyewitness, an authoritative spokesman who teaches the word of God without error for the sake of the church and that these super apostles that are presenting themselves in the church there are not real. And the way he defends himself in this particular verse, chapter 12, verse 12, is this. He says... The signs of an apostle were performed among you. So notice that phrase. Signs of an apostle were performed among you in all patience with signs and wonders and mighty works. Now, Paul insists, therefore, that he has done enough to accredit himself, to vindicate to verify that he's a real, true apostle, and he's done signs. The signs of an apostle. And somehow or other, signs and wonders and mighty works are connected to these signs of an apostle. And so the implication is that if he could vindicate his unique apostleship by doing the signs of an apostle, then surely not everybody could be doing the signs of an apostle. Then what good would the sign of an apostle be for crediting an apostle? Piece of evidence number three. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. In this verse, the writer of Hebrews is looking back on the day when the gospel first came to the community and Christians were evangelized or, or people were evangelized and Christians were called out. By the word of God. <clears throat> and it looks back on this day as a day when the apostles themselves, the eyewitnesses who had heard Jesus, brought the message with signs and wonders. It says, it was declared at first by the Lord. That's stage one. Jesus himself declared the gospel. And it was attested to us by a middle group, namely by those who heard him. That's the eyewitnesses. Those are the apostles. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his own will. So the argument, this pile of books here, is that here you have a community that evidently is not necessarily experiencing daily miracles like this, but look back on the time 
when the apostles themselves had brought the gospel to them. And at that point, in a remarkable way, God had vindicated the words and the authority of his apostles by doing signs and wonders and miracles. Fourth piece of evidence. The argument is that there is something unique about the ministry of Jesus that can't be repeated and is not intended to be repeated, and that the effort to take the ministry of Jesus and just transport it from his setting into our day involves mistakes. For example, in Matthew 10, 7, where Jesus is commissioning the twelve, the apostles, he says to them in verse 7 of Matthew 10, Preach as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. So preach as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Now, this stack of books says, wait a minute now, don't jump to the conclusion that just because Jesus sent out people that way, we should automatically go that way. Because two verses earlier, it says, Jesus speaking to those same group, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, do you obey that command? No, you most certainly don't and shouldn't. Why not? Jesus said it. And in Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go teach them to do whatever I commanded you. And you all know the answer. It's as clear as day. You don't obey that commandment because Jesus said, Stop obeying it. Namely, for three years I want to limit the ministry to the Jews. But after that... You go everywhere and teach the Gentiles and win people from every tribe and tongue and nation. So we don't obey that command. And once you see that, then you have to ask, well, are there other commands that Jesus gave to his disciples that maybe he doesn't intend to be repeated today? And then the argument simply completes itself by saying, given the hints in the New Testament that signs and wonders were to be done by the hands of the apostles... Therefore, Jesus doesn't mean that a healing ministry of a miraculous kind is supposed to be the normative ministry of the church after his resurrection and the apostles are gone. Finally, number five. An argument from church history. There never has been, to my knowledge, anybody or any group who has, in fact, continued the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. And by that I mean there never has been anybody who healed like Jesus healed and healed like the apostles healed. Instantaneously, infallibly, and the hardest cases included. All healing movements that I know of avoid the hardest cases. They heal in process generally and not instantaneously. And they fail very often. There are no duplications in history of the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. Period. If you know of one, please tell me about it. That's not saying there aren't miracles. That's not saying there aren't healings. There just never has been anything like the apostles and Jesus' ministry since that day. And the implication then is, well, in view of all these other four arguments, isn't that a good clue that Jesus just didn't intend for it to be? A duplication of what he and the apostles did. So for reasons like that, and those aren't the only ones, I have a, a long little footnote here in my notes that you can get from the manuscript in the file cabinet if you want to see three or four other kinds of arguments. But for those kinds of arguments, this group of people say that signs and wonders have ceased as, as a normative part of the church's ministry, the way the apostles and Jesus used them. 
So let's go to this pile of books over here now. What are the arguments used by these people? And these are people who believe that signs and wonders, including miracles and exorcism and the like, are for today. They ought to be sought for the blessing of the church and the empowering of our mission. And the reason we don't see more miracles of healing and exorcism and so on is because we are so secular in our mindset and so resistant and so doubting and so unbelieving that Jesus isn't about to act against our expectations. You remember the time that Jesus came into one village and it said he, he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief except that he healed a few people. So it is possible to have a community spirit and a community atmosphere that is so antagonistic to the miraculous that Jesus won't bother us with them. That's the possibility. That would be the explanation given by most of these people for why we don't see more in our day. So what are the reasons that they believe that the signs and wonders are still present? Reason number one. It does seem that Jesus intends for there to be a continuity between his kind of ministry and our kind of ministry today. He does seem to want us to continue on his kind of ministry. Let me show you what I mean and why I think this from these books. <clears throat> In Luke 9, 2, for example, when Jesus sent out the 12, <clears throat> it says, He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. To preach and to heal. And then... In the next chapter, when he sent out the 70, he sent out the 12 and then he sent out the 70. The 70 are not apostles. He said to the 70 in Luke 10, 9, Whenever you enter a town, heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. Now, the point I want to make from Luke 9, 2 and Luke 10, 9 is that in the ministry of Jesus, the preaching of the kingdom and healing were together. So that when they said, the kingdom has come near you, they healed people to demonstrate the kind of kingdom that it was. They didn't heal everybody. And those people that got healed died, and got sick again and died. So that these healings were tokens they were the powers of the age to come breaking in. They were foretastes of the kind of kingdom we're going to inherit someday fully at the consummation. And so he was saying, preach the kingdom and then show the kingdom. Preach it and show it. Now, in Matthew 24, 14, which is the text we preached on six weeks ago when we began this series, Jesus says, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the nations. Now, that still needs to be done. There are 12,000 unreached people groups in this world today. It's our job as a church to reach some of those. And I thank God that so many of our young people are burdened and are going. They're going to reach those people. This gospel of the kingdom should be preached. Now, the assumption is then... If the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached is not only to be preached to the Jews, but to all the peoples, ought it not to be preached with somewhat the same way? Pretty much the same way? You see, I think the interpretational tip-off for why this argument is made is this. If Jesus commanded something to be done in his ministry and doesn't command that it not be done, then probably we ought to go ahead and do it. So when he commanded, only go to Jews, he made sure that he said at the end of his life, go and make disciples of all nations. I rescind that command right now. I rescind it. You got it? Go beyond the Jews to everybody. But he never did that with healing. He never said, stop healing. He never said anything like stop healing. In fact, he said something almost the opposite of stop healing. In John 14, 12, he said, Truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will do the works that I do. Not apostles will do the works that I do. 
But he who believes in me, just like he who believes in me will have everlasting life. He who believes in me will do the works that I do. Now, I don't know the details of what that means. Tom Schreiner is teaching a Sunday school class right now, I think. Wrote a paper. Called him on the phone yesterday. He said, I finished my paper on John 14, 12. I said, good, let me have it because I don't know what that verse means. But the least that verse means, the works that I do, those who believe in me will do also, is some kind of continuity. Some kind. So argument number one for the people in this stack here is that Jesus does seem to tell us that the gospel of the kingdom ought to have a kind of continuity as it's preached to the end of the world. Argument number two. The people in this stack, when they go to the book of Acts, recognize that the apostles by and large are doing signs and wonders, but they point out that deacons are doing signs and wonders too. Two of them in particular. Stephen and Philip who are not apostles. For example, Acts chapter 6, verse 8, Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Now, Stephen was not an apostle. And it doesn't say that the power that he had was owing to apostolic blessing. It says he was full of power. He was full of grace. Philip went down to the Samaritans, and he was an evangelist. He's called an evangelist deacon. And he preached. God did signs through his life. It says, chapter 8, verse 6, And the multitudes with one accord gave heed to what was said by Philip when they, did, when they heard him and saw the signs which he did. Now, you know what's remarkable about Philip's situation is this. Um... After he had preached and done these remarkable signs and people began to believe, the apostles got word of it. And they came down to check it out and to add their blessing through the laying on of hands. You know what that says to me? Philip was not functioning as an apostle. There had to be added that apostolic blessing in order for the unity of the church to be demonstrated between Samaritans and Jews. He was just out there as an ordinary evangelist deacon doing the work of the ministry. And God came down with signs. And so the second argument is that it won't do to say that only apostles did signs and wonders. Philip and Stephen did them as well. Number three, Galatians chapter three, verse five. And the more I've thought about this verse, the more it becomes, I think, one of the strongest arguments for this pile of books here. And I have read the arguments on both sides. Like this book right here has an extended argument for why what I'm about to say is not so. It will not work in my judgment. And I deal with that in my notes, and you can look at it if you want to in the writing when you get it. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says he's been there recently, and he's preached the gospel. And it says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And the answer, of course, is by hearing with faith. And so he's saying, God is supplying the Spirit to you, not to me, not to the apostles, but to you. I don't think you can get around that phrase and say that this was a blessing poured out upon the apostolic ministry a few months or weeks earlier when they were there. Not a single commentary that I've ever read holds that view until recently when the argument has been taken up in the polemical context of this issue. Virtually every commentary before the last 10 years, probably, I can't prove that because I haven't read them, but I've read a bunch, 
And they all, the ones that I've looked at, say, when it says he supplies the Spirit to you, it means to you and not to the apostles. And works miracles among you. And therefore, the argument, I think, is a very strong one that quite apart from Paul's presence in their midst, miracles were being done in the early church by the believers in the Galatian churches. Fourth argument, 1 Corinthians 12. The spiritual gifts are taught about here, and you're familiar with the spiritual gifts, I believe. But the thing that is crucial to notice here is that the gifts of miracles and the gifts of healing are distinguished from the apostolic calling. And therefore, the argument that the gift of healing and the gift of miracles were only performed by apostles because they were part of the apostolic calling is highly unlikely. Verses 7 to 10 says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I'm skipping a few words. To the one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another... Gifts of healing, verse 9, gifts of healing to another, workings of miracles. So gifts are given, and some of those gifts are healing, and some of those gifts are miracle working. And then drop down to verse 28, and you'll see how these two gifts are separated from the apostolate. It says, verse 28, God has appointed the church in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then miracles, and then gifts of healings. You see, so you, the apostles are here, and then there's prophets, and then there's teachers, and then you've got, in addition to that, miracles and healings. And so it's just not true, as far as this argument appears, that only apostles were doing miracles and healings, signs and wonders, in the early church. So, for reasons like those, and there are others, which I also have here, but we'll pass over, this stack of books, these people argue that signs and wonders are not limited to the age of the apostles, but are intended to be pursued for the blessing of the church and for the empowering of our outreach. But what shall we say now, in conclusion? Very personally, I... Uh, find in this tradition virtually every teacher that I've ever loved and benefited from. Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Owen, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon, Benjamin Warfield, my own physical father, virtually every seminary teacher I had are these people. I love these people. These are my kind of people. 